We who know Christ are members of the family of God. We are children of God. We are children. You're you're not just citizens of heaven. You are a child of God. And this is the beauty of the Christian message. Our family ultimately is in heaven. Praise the Lord. Jesus. Amen. If you could stand to your feet today for the reading of God's word. Uh, If we can get Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 on the screen. And if we could read this together. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Praise God. We just read it together out loud. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order and establish it with judgment and justice, from this time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is Hope is Born. And I want to start by uh, not only reading Isaiah 9 and 6, but I'm going to read Luke chapter 2 to you. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, Because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered at Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while he was there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were there in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. And so when we look at uh, Luke chapter 2 and uh, in conjunction with Isaiah chapter 9 and 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And, um, you know, in these verses, uh, we see the promise and the appearance of the long-awaited Christ, the Messiah. Not only the hope of Israel, but the hope of all mankind. Because as the old song goes, Christ the Savior is born. I think it's ironic that at a time time in the world where we see so much polarization, division, hatred, distrust, and disillusionment in our society... And, 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 you know, we, we see it manifesting itself both locally and internationally. Lives, homes, marriages, communities coming apart at the seams. Nations and peoples at war with the possibility of regional conflicts escalating into something bigger or even into world war. It's significant, therefore, that the symbol of hope for our time is not a political leader, a scientist, a a physician, or a general, but rather a baby in a manger. 
You know, every year, uh, uh, certainly th- those of us uh, th- that are Irish, we have a-, a tradition of putting out a nativity scene on a table, Mary and Joseph, the baby Jesus, angels, shepherds, wise men, and of course, a few farm animals with the baby Jesus in the manger. And we find hope in this simple scene because there's a simplicity and a serenity to the manger scene, um, you know, that speaks to us in our rushed and our pressurized uh, modern lives because it captures a sacred moment in the history of the world, a day in time from which all of our calendars um, are based because from this day onwards, um, history will forever be divided into AD, uh, into BC and AD. AD is simply Latin, anu, uh, anu, anu Domini, which means the year of our Lord. Because his story, amen, we, we talk about history, but you know what? History ultimately is his story. It is the story of Christ. And this is why, like I said, you know, the year 2022, it's timed from the birth of Christ our Savior. You might say, oh, well, we replaced it with um, uh, 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 CE and uh, uh, BCE. But really, they're just a euphemism uh, to, to, you know, that secular people have desired to put because they want to replace the acknowledgement of Christ our Savior. And it doesn't change the date. You can use that secular term, but it simply doesn't change the fact that uh, our date, our calendar is timed from the birth of Christ our Savior. And so, like I said, history is his story. And you see, the manger presents us with a snapshot of a peace and a tranquility uh, th- that cannot be found in the things of this world, but only in God. And h- how desperately we need that peace in our generation, because let's be honest, the last number of years have been very difficult. Fear, frustration, isolation, loneliness, and bereavement as a direct consequence of COVID, lockdowns, and state-sponsored propaganda, which caused such terror in people that many people, I believe, have been marked for life. You know, all of this pressure coupled with the loss of loved ones, many of whom who are left to die alone um, uh, for the greater good. It was for the greater good, Pastor. Well, you may not have felt like that if you were the granny dying alone without even being able to hold the hand of a loved one. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, and, and on top of that, those who are bereaved, Um, weren't even able to grieve properly because numbers at funerals were either limited or they weren't allowed at all. And, uh, you know, so as as a consequence of this, uh, I believe many people have been left at a place where they are emotionally uh, numb. Okay, and so uh, even on the far side of COVID, we're living in days where many people are finding it hard to pay electricity bills, you know, heat their homes, pay their mortgages, put food on the table because of COVID and climate change, um, uh, you know, which have caused much of this inflation. We can blame it on Russia all we want, but the reality is we're really living with the consequences of the fact that we completely shut down um, our economies for, for, for months uh, at a time, even years, and you know, many businesses devastated as a consequence of that. This this is important for us to understand because um, it, it, this last year we've seen the price of so many things going through the, the roof, and as a consequence of this, and and it will get better. Stick with me. Um, uh, you know, many people are struggling with fear, uncertainty, depression, and and despair. And yet, in the midst of these dark and and challenging and confused times, we can find hope in celebrating the birth of Christ, our Savior, God's sinless Son. Because in this simple, serene scene that we see in the manger, the long-awaited Messiah is born. Declared by prophets, heralded by angels, witnessed by shepherds, honored by wise men, and recorded by Matthew and Luke. Christ the Savior is born. And hope is born along with him. John chapter 20 and verse 1, we're looking at the resurrection of Christ. 
And um, it says, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark. And um, it says, she, she ran, uh, and she noticed that the body had been taken away. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple were going to the tomb. So um, uh, it says, John went in and looked. And uh, verse 5, and stooping down and looking in. Peter saw the linen cloths lying there, and he did not go in. Sorry, John did. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And so the, the Bible talks about how the disciples went and looked inside uh, the tomb. Okay, And um, like Peter and John, who were diligent to look inside the empty tomb, let us also take a moment this morning to take one more look at the manger. And as we do, I believe we will find hope because we find hope because firstly, we find love. First John 4 verse 8 says, God is love. That word love is agape. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. Again, that word is agape, the most commonly used word for love, which means love that gives without expecting anything in return. Uh, unconditional, selfless love. Um, this is the love of God the Father. God is love. And when we look at the manger, we see so much love. You, you see so much love. In particular, the love of a mother for her child. And you could say there is no greater love. It's a reminder of this sacred call because Mary is firstly a mother, not a person who is pregnant, not, a, you know, a person who's going to have a child, a, a woman, a, a mother, a, a, a woman, you could divide it and say a womb man, a human with a womb. Okay. As opposed to a man. And so if you don't have a womb, you're not and never can be. A woman. You know, maybe we need to adjust the spelling of woman to make it clear uh, to our confused generation that there is a very clear distinction between male and female. Because the trans movement is making a parody of womanhood by these cheap, shallow, and highly sexualized representations of what they imagine constitutes a female. And ultimately, ultimately, that is all they can do is imagine because a, a man can never actually be a woman, nor can a woman be a man. And again, you may find that offensive. All right. You say, I just came to church to, to, to hear a little message about a baby in a manger. Just let me go. Well, pick somewhere else then. I'm, I'm here to preach the gospel. Okay. And I believe that the birth of Christ, our Savior, is something that, that, that speaks even to our generation today. Okay, so like I said, if you are offended by uh, biology and just as importantly by theology, um, there is no hope for you outside of repentance and renewing your mind because ultimately you are fighting against God and the reality that he created. You might as well be offended at gravity. Okay, feel free, but you can't change it because facts don't care about feelings. Okay, you can whine, protest, shake your fist at the intolerance of those who refuse to endorse your mental illness or mental delusions. But long after you are dead and buried, the reality is that God's law and God's order will prevail. This is why Psalm 119 verse 65 says, uh, uh, 165 says, great peace have those who love your law and nothing shall offend them. The, the, the problem is we got churches that are full of people who do not love God's law and therefore they're offended at biology. They're offended at theology. And so again, if you want to call yourself a Christian, you must love his law. You must love his word. You must love his order, irrespective of how that may challenge you personally. That's good preaching, Pastor John. Come on, church. Let's wake up. You see, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. You can love truth or you can reject truth, but you cannot change or redefine truth. Amen? You cannot change truth. It's a fact. And so, again, uh, sadly, the Cambridge Dictionary just expanded their definition of a woman. You might say, what's this got to do? Mary was a woman. Mary was a mother. And I think it's important to take a moment to focus and contemplate and reflect on that fact. 
Mary was a mother. And yet the Cambridge Dictionary just expanded their definition of a woman to include an adult who lives and identifies as female, though they may um, have uh, uh, said to have had a different sex at birth. Ironically, even the medical world isn't immune to this stupidity with terms like mother now being deemed as redundant or politically incorrect. Instead, hospitals being encouraged and even commanded to use terms like people who are pregnant, parent one, parent two, as if anyone other than a male and a female can actually create a baby. But you know, notwithstanding the foolishness, lies, and propaganda, there is a sacred nature to motherhood. And God bestows a certain dignity uh, upon this calling because Christ, our Savior, was born of a woman, just like you and just like me. Amen? And so there is a sacred simplicity to this scene that we witness at the manger. There's no, there's no tinsel or turkeys, no marble throne, no VIPs or celebrities, no feast or servants or assistants at hand, just a mother and her baby and a man who is willing to answer the call to love, protect, provide, and be a father to a child who was not his. I look at the manger scene and I don't know what they had or didn't have. They certainly didn't have an expensive stroller or designer cot or fancy clothes. They didn't have photographers and journalists fawning over them and, 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 and looking for a quote from the, the, the happy couple. Um, but, but one thing they did have was love. And ultimately, it is love that turns a house into a home. And even a cold, smelly stable into a palace. Amen. Because love is what makes the difference. And that's why the first thing we see in the manger is love. And again, you might be sitting here today and saying, um, if only I had this or, or, or that, or if I could get a promotion or a pay raise or buy my own home, I would be happy. No, things do not make you happy. These aren't the things that make you happy. It is love because we were created to love and be loved. And if that need isn't being met, nothing will make you happy. And, and, and so again, is your heart and your home filled with the love of Jesus Christ? You might not be able to buy your kids all that they want, but you can give them love like no one else on this planet. Amen. Your kids need you to spend your time with them and not just your money. And if it's a choice of one or the other, kids will always pick time. Love is what transforms people and places because long after your kids have left your home and even after you have left this planet, they will remember how you loved them. I think of my granddad, John Joe King, uh, as a little boy, four or five years of age, he was orphaned along with his brothers and his sister, thrown into a, a, an orphanage and, and then going through, you know, the brutal reality of the Irish industrial schools where there was so much abuse and God knows what he saw or experienced. I mean, he didn't see his baby sister for about 30 or 40 years. And, and, um, and, and yet, how did a man like that who never knew a, a, a stable home life become such a great father, such a great family man? And I, I still remember to this day him lifting me up in the air and tickling me with his face and, 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 and just hugging me and, and, and uh, uh, drawing pictures for me. And he was always saying to people, look at that boy, he'll, he'll go far. He was always encouraging me and, and just loving me. I, I used to spend months every, every summer in, in my grandmother's house. My, my mom had eight kids. She didn't even miss me. Uh, um, I, I remember she used to be giving out the dinner at the table with a big long table and she'd be giving out potatoes or beans and she'd be throwing them on your plate and say, do you want this? She was going on to the next person. Sometimes she'd be saying, you know, uh, 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 Michael, John, Pat, what's your name? That, re that really made you feel special being called, what's your name? By your mother. But um, uh, it, it was what it was. But, but I, I still, you know, my grandfather's probably dead 35 years or more. And, and, and yet, I still think about him a lot and, and, and the impact that he had on my life. Because you see, you can bury a person, but their love for you lives on in your heart. Amen. And, and this is why, again, things 
Things fade away. Things rust. They get old. They get whatever. But you know what? Love is something. Uh, there's an eternal nature to love. And that's why we still carry our loved ones long after uh, they're dead. And, and you know what? Christmas is an annual reminder of the power of love. Um, it's a reminder that love never fails. And it doesn't die either. God so loved the world. You see, Christmas, the, the reason we celebrate this, because sometimes we can lose the meaning in the midst of the, the shopping and the queues and the hassle and the stress and I got to cook the turkey and the, this and that and the other, and we can forget what it's actually about. And so every time I walk past new parents, I, I sense that love. Every time I do a child's dedication, and, and when you see the way they're, the, the parents look at that child and even the way they hold them, to me, it's, it's an indication of, of, of that special love. And I, anytime I see that, I stand in awe at the call of God. Because truly, parenthood is first and foremost a call to love. Two selfish, flawed individuals fall in love, marry and have kids. And along the way, something changes. Something supernatural happens. And like the Grinch, our hearts begin to beat and grow bigger. Amen. And so when you look at your child, something supernatural rises up on the inside of you. An unselfish desire to bless. A willingness to literally do anything for that little person because you are in love. And this is, what, this is why we find hope at Christ's birth. Because we see so much love. How Mary must have loved Jesus as she cradled him in, in her arms and kept him warm in, in that stable. Do you know that Mary was the very first person to love the Lord Jesus Christ? And I think that's a, 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 a tremendous thing because women have been gifted with a supernatural maternal instinct that men just don't have. Nobody can love, uh, you know, their kids like their mother. You know, as men, we, we, you know, we bring what we bring and, you know, we like to throw them up in the air and all these different things. But, but you know, there's something supernatural about that maternal instinct. And, you know, this modern society is seeking to airbrush that and, and diminish that and even uh, undermine and destroy that, uh, you know, in the name of feminism, in the name of freedom and all of these uh, euphemisms they use for murdering babies, but the reality is this, there's something supernatural God has placed in women to love their children. You see, there's no substitute for love. Think of the elaborate scene that we might have set for the arrival of God's throne. Uh, a, a, a golden, uh, you know, a, 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 the, the arrival of God's son. A, a golden throne and, you know, gaudy decoration and how we would argue over who was worthy to witness such a momentous occasion as the arrival of God's son on this planet. Think about it. How we would fight over the guest list and, and the accomplishments that we would deem necessary um, to qualify even as a contender to make the short list to witness the arrival of God's son on earth. And yet God chose farm animals and illiterate shepherds to witness the arrival of his son. He didn't place him in a, in a golden throne or a marble palace. He placed him into a, a, a manger which was an animal's feeding trough. Think about that. Surrounded by animals and farm animals and, and shepherds, uneducated shepherds. Take that, vegans. <laughs> God chose farm animals, not wild animals, farm animals. So you can put up all, all the weird posters you want about, you know, in calling. You know, the calf of a cow, her baby, and ta a dairy takes babies from their mothers. And the very same people will argue that a baby in the womb is not a baby. These people are not mentally well, I'm sorry. And I don't buy that. I come from the country. I've been eating meat all my life. And I'm not going to stop. If they ban it, I'll just, I'll just take your dog some night. <laughs> Barbecue him. Glory to Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, woof. <laughs> but think about it, shepherds. Because position and title might impress us, but not God. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. 
As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Charles Spurgeon tells the story of a young mother who was sick and how her sister took her daughter um, to her house and sadly, the woman died. And because the child was very young, they didn't tell uh, the, the child that her mother had died. But the child kept insisting she wanted to go back home. She wanted to go back home. So eventually, her, her sister relented and brought this little child to the house. And the child ran through this big old house, opening each door, flinging them open, crying out, Mama, Mama, Mama. And eventually, once she'd exhausted every room, she came back to her, to her aunt and said, Take me out of here. Take me out of here. You see, it was her mother that made that house a home. And in the absence of her mother, it just became a house again. And so this is why, again, we look at the birth of Christ and we see so much love. Remember this Christmas, give honor to your mother and to the mother of your child. Because it's a mother that makes Christmas and it's a father who pays for it. And that's another issue. But in the same way, it was the love of Mary that transformed that humble little cow shed or cave or whatever it was into, um, you know, a home. She, she, her love turned that place into a home. You know, many times as a pastor, I've heard of how deceased uh, parents or brothers or sisters visit a person um, before or at the time of their death. And some say this is simply the feverish delusions of, of the sick or the suffering. But I believe it's a reflection of the love and mercy of the Father. He knows that we fear dying. He knows that, that we fear crossing the, the Jordan, so to speak. And so he sends angels and sometimes maybe he even sends family members to show us the way and to assure us that we have nothing to fear. Amen. Because just as the church is a family and not an institution or an organization, ultimately it's just a poor earthly reflection of a glorious heavenly reality. We who know Christ are members of the family of God. We are children of God. We are children. You're, you're not just citizens of heaven. You are a child of God. And this is the beauty of the Christian message. Our family ultimately is in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That was the greatest promise that Paul could give. Is that, you know what? After this life, as good or as bad as it might have been. After the ups and the downs and the struggles and the trials. Ultimately we are going home. A believer does not die. They go home to be with the Lord. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Psalm 23. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever in Jesus name this is the beauty of the promises of God to us what did Jesus say do not let your heart be troubled neither let them be afraid in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I'd have told you I go to prepare a place for you amen you see love turned a stable into a home the love of Mary and Joseph that they had for the baby Jesus was a reflection, a pale reflection of God's love for you and for me. And one day we will go home to be with our Father in heaven forever. Because let me say this, the time will come when there will be no more giants to face, no more mountains to climb, no more battles to fight. We're going to lay down our sword and our shield and we're going to go home to be with our Father forever. This is the promise that we have, that we're going to go home. We're going to stand before the Father. And we're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew Henry said this, if God says, well done, good and faithful servant, it is of little consequence who says otherwise. Think about that. What people say about you is irrelevant. What matters is what God says about you. And this is our blessed hope. That Christ our Lord will one day return and we will go to be with him. That's why Titus 2 and verse 13. And it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, you can study the religions and philosophies of this world. And you may find a degree of wisdom, knowledge, morality. You may even find some inspiration, but you will not find love. Because love is personified in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Love is personified in Christ and Christ alone. 1 John 3.16 This is love. This is how we know what love is. 
Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I look at the manger and I look at the cross. And I'm reminded that I matter. I'm reminded that I am loved. Firstly, we look at the manger, we see love. Secondly, we see light. You know, it's interesting that Hanukkah, the um, Jewish festival of lights, occurs between late uh, November and December. The Jews uh, celebrate it by light, lighting the menorah and by eating lots of special food. There's a lot more parallels between Jews and Christians than we might realize. They like the lights and they love to eat some food. And uh, isn't that really what we do at, at, at Christmas in a way? And we give gifts and they give gifts as well. But, you know, they, they celebrate Hanukkah in, in remembrance of um, uh, 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 the, the battle uh, that was fought. The Maccabees fought against the Greeks and Syrians who were led by Antiochus IV. And he sought to enforce pagan worship um, in Israel. Um, he, he banned the Jewish rituals and, and sought to enforce pagan Hellenistic worship. And all seemed lost. But one man by the name of, um, a, 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 a Jew by the name of Judas Maccabee, he led a revolt and he fought against great odds. Even though they were greatly outnumbered, they won. And it was probably one of the greatest uh, uh, victories the, the Jewish people ever won historically. And, uh, and so the first thing they did was they lit the, the sacred menorah in the temple, but there was only enough oil for one day. And miraculously, it kept burning for eight days, which was the time needed for them to, to make more oil. And in some ways, you could say that the, uh, the Feast of Hanukkah or Festival of Hanukkah symbolizes how sometimes you have to fight for religious freedom. You know, some of you might realize we had to fight to get the churches open again. Uh, because there's something tremendously significant spiritually to the gathering of the saints. And the devil doesn't want it to happen. But you know what? Uh, we had to fight. And it's interesting that the rabbis, uh, the Jewish rabbis uh, teach that the feast symbolizes the principle that a little light can cast out a lot of darkness. And in the very same way, this is why when Christ came to this world, he declared, I am the light of the world. We were lost in sin and shame and darkness, but Christ came and shone his light and set us free from the enemy that had a hold on us. And that's why when we look at the manger, we don't just see love, we see light. Amen. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. I don't know about you. I refuse to focus on the prophetic uh, utterances of, of men uh, that are being used by the devil in our generation. You know, to, to push forward an antichrist agenda. Whether that's Klaus Schwab or Gates or whoever else. You know, they, who want to recreate society in their own image. I choose to look at Jesus. And I believe that the light is greater than the darkness. And that's why we don't have to fret or worry or be anxious or afraid. You know what? Since time immemorial, evil men have plotted and planned and, and uh, you, you know, tried to push their agenda. But each time, you know, the Lord, the Bible says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against them. And you know what? I believe that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. How many believe that in Jesus' name? You know what? Come what may in 2023, you're going to be able to face it because the Lord is with you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? In him, was life and that light, that in him was life and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not uh, comprehend it. Another version, the darkness could not overcome it. And so this, this passage tells us that the light shines and cannot be extinguished. Jesus declared in John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If you're following Jesus, don't walk in darkness. If you're walking with him, amen, you need to walk in the light. The paradox is, is the appearance of Christ, um, uh, the light of the world, is that it was a very dark time. You know, Matthew chapter 2 talks about Herod, and Herod uh, clearly was um, an evil man. Uh, verse 
16, and it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in the districts from two years old and under, according to the time which were determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was written by Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Re Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And, um, you know, here we have the slaughter of the innocents. Do you know that uh, the Greek liturgy says that he killed 14,000 infants in the slaughter of the holy in innocents? Um, while an early Syrian list of saints asserts 94,000. And uh, Coptic or Egyptian sources say 144,000. And assert it took place on the 29th of December. You know, Herod was paranoid. Um, he was paranoid that people were plotting to, to overthrow him. And, and thus, he had um, his wife and three of his children murdered, um, uh, you know, as a consequence of this. And one of his children, he had him murdered five days before Herod died himself. And so, true Herod and true Pilate, Rome was, was ruling the land of Israel with an iron fist. It was a dark time. And yet, in the midst of the darkness of those days, we see the birth of Christ was was uh, signified by a great light, the star of Bethlehem. And um, here we see Balaam in Numbers 24 says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And so even in the Old Testament, we see this prophecy that, that a star will come forth, that, uh, you know, uh, the, the birth of Christ was associated with, with great light. And so we have this consistent theme of light regarding Christ's life and ministry. His birth uh, marked a new dawn for all of mankind. John 12 and 46, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all those who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. And so Jesus acknowledged, I came to bring light. You know, Matthew chapter 4, speaking of the beginning of the ministry of Christ, in verse 16, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Amen. And, and, and so Jesus came to bring light into our societies. The Bible says the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Because the, the light of Christ shone in the darkness of our lands, our people and our cultures. I think it's important to understand that where the gospel went, civilization followed. Not perfection. All of our peoples may have our stories of being oppressed by others who may or may not have had the Christian religion. But this is the reality. Where the gospel went, civilization as we know it followed. Amen. It's important to make the distinction, civilization, not perfection. Amen. Because the West as we know it, the Western world, as we know it, is far from perfect. But it's as free a society as has ever lived. Um, has ever existed. People complain about, you know, that the women didn't have the, the, the vote 100 years ago. But, you know, you go back 100, 150 years ago, the majority of our peoples lived in abject poverty with a small group of elites, you know, whether arist aristoc aristocrats, kings, etc., ruling um, over people who just lived and died in abject poverty. And um, so, uh, but anyway, the, the freedoms that we enjoy were born of the Judeo-Christian values that shone light into our lands because you know what get rid of any romantic ideas you might have of 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 these just or noble um uh, pagan civilizations they didn't exist because uh, you know and and this is the reality as we go back to becoming pagan civilizations again we will watch uh, those freedoms uh, you know, that we have enjoyed and taken for granted, we're going to watch those very same freedoms vanish. And it's being done currently in the name, it was done in the name of COVID. It's being done in the name of climate change. Um, uh, ultimately, it always seems to boil down to uh, a lot, uh, control and loss of freedom um, in the name of the greater good, so to speak. But, um, you know, you look at the ancient In Incas, Aztecs, or the Maya cultures, uh, and the multitudes of people that they captured and sacrificed to their gods. We see Baal worship in ancient Israel, the Middle East. 
the practice of sati, which was burning a, a widow on her husband's funeral pyre, even if she was still alive, um, in parts of India, uh, a human sacrifice, West Africa, Peru, even in this nation. Uh, if you look back historically, there was evidence of some human sacrifice. You see, sadly, this is the fact. The further we turn from Christ, the more we go back into the darkness again. You know, just this week, I was appalled. I was watching a video of, um, you, you know, these people were going through a, 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 a dumpster. I think it was in upstate New York. And they heard whimpering. They, they pulled out a plastic bag and there was a little baby in there. And there was security footage five or six hours earlier. This is freezing cold. And five or six hours earlier, a woman pulls up and pulls a black bag. And she throws it about 10 feet in the air into the, into the skip. And that bag contained a, a beautiful, precious little, little baby, which miraculously survived. And um, this is the tragedy of where our, our society has come to. And yet, there is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, what has been will be again. And what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Just give me four or five minutes and I'm finished. There is nothing new under the sun. Do you know that the exposure of infants um, was normalized in ancient Rome? There were places in the city where you could bring a child, where you could bring a baby and, and just leave them out to die. Or else they could be taken by those who would uh, uh, bring them up as slaves or put them into brothels. Forgive me for being so blunt, but that, that is historic. Okay. You know, if you study Babylonian, Roman, Islamic uh, society, Greek society, civilization, you will find beauty, intelligence, culture, education, engineering, but you won't find light. You will find darkness and brutality. And this is why we find hope in Christ's birth, because we find light. He shows us a different way. You know, Mark chapter 14 and verse 15. Here the apostles are speaking and they said, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea and all that is in them. And I believe our society needs to turn from our wickedness and from our sin and from our depravity because just because we make something legal does not mean it is right. Jeremiah 17 and 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, humanism, the belief that uh, we as humans find the answers in reason and science is a failed ideology. The last century and its wars and its genocide and its massacres put paid to the idea that all we need is simply education, culture and reason. The Nazis were educated and cultured. During COVID, we were constantly told to trust the science. Let me say this, as somebody who went and studied engineering in college, that is the most asinine statement you could ever make. Trust the science isn't actually scientific. The reason you make progress in science is you question science. And yet, you know, these last number of weeks have revealed you know, that there was terrible censorship going on. You know, the FBI and these others censoring American citizens. And I'm sure it wasn't just happening in America. I'm sure it's happening in Europe and probably here in Ireland as well. Where certain voices who are speaking inconvenient truth were being censored. And this is what Romans 1 talks about. Men who suppress the truth. Because there's nothing more dangerous than truth to those who want to propagate lies. And so when people said, trust the science, the reality is science lied and people died. Because the answer to the ultimate questions of life aren't found in science, reason, or logic. The enlightenment is a fallacy. This idea that happiness is found through studying uh, true, true reason. If you study history, um, uh, you know, try to reason out the wickedness and evil and depravity of man. And you will discover this. There is no light without Jesus, the light of the world. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. This is why we desperately need the light of Christ. It's interesting. The shortest and therefore the darkest day of the year here in Ireland is December 21. But you cannot perceive a lengthening of the day until December 25 
Today is the first day that you can perceive a slightly longer day, which is symbolic of how light always overcomes darkness. Glory to God. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And so it's, already, it's, it's kind of ironic. I mean, John 12 and 46, I've come as a light into the world so that those who believe in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus said it's the light of the world and therefore it's ironic that we have lights everywhere. You know, I was looking out of my house last night and because we're high up, we can see for miles and miles. And last night, I hadn't seen it before, most likely because the whole people are afraid of the electricity bills. But last night, the whole place was just lit up. You could just see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes with their beautiful lights outside them. You know, we hang lights inside our home, outside our home, on our streets. And yet, in many instances, we've completely forgotten why we do that. We do that because we are celebrating Jesus, the light of the world. Amen? He is the reason. You know, Paul the Apostle, when he encountered Christ, he saw a bright light. A, a, bright, a light that was so bright, it blinded him. You know, people say, when they mock Christians, oh, I've seen the light. When I was in college, I used to walk into 50 or 60 guys in the class. You know, one guy would start singing the hallelujah chorus, and another guy say, I've seen the light. <laughs> Making fun of me because I was a Christian. Tragically, that young man, not too long afterwards, ended his life. Sometimes people who are laughing at you aren't actually laughing at you. They're crying out. They're crying out to see, is this real? They're probing you. They're searching. Jesus is the light of the world. The Bible says in, in Ephesians that we were without hope. We were without God. Ephesians chapter 2. We were in darkness. And so, again, when people say, I've seen the light, the question is, have you? Have you seen the light? Because without Jesus, we are without hope. But we saw the light and he set us free. 2 Peter 1.19 We have a more sure word of prophecy with which you do well to take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star shine in your heart. Has the light of Jesus Christ shone in your heart? Because in the midst of the confusion and darkness of these days, I believe the light of Christ will shine on us and in us and through us. And that's why it says, arise and shine. Uh, uh, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. We're living in this day where there is gross darkness and depravity and confusion in our society. And it's so important that we don't become desensitized to it. Because there are those who are seeking to normalize that which is not normal. No, we're called to walk in the light. We're called to walk in the light and not apologize to anybody for that fact. I want to ask you today, are you walking in the light of Jesus Christ? I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not free, but to give you a hope and a future. We have hope only because we have light. You see, we aren't stepping out into the dark night with no assurance of where we're going in life or after death. The light of Christ has shone in our hearts and our homes. And we're no longer in ignorance. We're no longer facing an uncertain future after we die. We have hope because Jesus Christ is our light and the lover of our soul. Jeremiah 23 and 12 I've not departed from the commands of your lips. I've treasured the words of thy mouth more than my daily bread. You see, we treasure his word because it is our daily bread. As the worship group come forward, we treasure his word because it is the truth. When we look at the manger, we find love. When we look at the manger, we find light. And lastly, two minutes and I'm finished. We look at the manger and we find life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He said in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life. Amen. John 1, 4 says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. You see, his light and his life go together. Jesus, you know, John 3, 16 promises everlasting life to those who believe in Jesus Christ. 
You know, Isaiah 9 and 6 says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And how our generation desperately needs the peace that only Jesus Christ can bring. You see, Christ promises us everlasting life. Life that never ends. Because you know what? The reality is this. Every Christmas is a sobering reality that you are a year older. Some of you may be in your 20s or 30s or 40s or 60s or 70s. But when you think about it, when you think about how quickly the years have passed and it's brought you to this point, Christmas is a very sobering time because we realize how quickly our life passes away. Christmas is a time when people feel lonely because they think about those, the loved ones they have lost because this is the reality. We fear death. This explains why grown adults go to see Marvel movies. Because we want to believe in superhumans. We want to see life that isn't limited by death. Even if we uh, have to watch it on a screen portrayed by those who are paid to pretend. We want to believe that there is life beyond this one. You see, mankind longs for Superman. Mankind longs for a savior, a deliverer. And that's why the Bible says, behold the lamb. Behold the Lamb of God. Matthew 1, 21, He will save His people from their sins. You see, the very thing that has tormented mankind down through the ages, which is our sin, our consciousness of guilt and sin and shame, for which we have no solution. We have no answer. Doesn't matter how educated you become or how cultured, how accomplished, how wealthy, you know in your heart you are a sinner. And you know that the, 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 the sand is passing through, you know, the hourglass and you are getting older. You see, we have no hope aside from the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we find life, we find forgiveness, and we find hope through Christ. We find hope because he has gone before us and he stands with us. My final verse, Hebrews 6 and 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, but sure and steadfast. And which enters the presence behind the veil. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. Having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul. If you could stand to your feet today. I want to ask you, do you have that hope? I'm not asking, were you baptized as a baby or do you pray or are you a good person or are you trying really, really hard? None of those things can be saved. None of those things can save you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So I think it would be a very wonderful thing is if you are not saved and if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, today you can respond and receive him. What a day to get saved. What a day to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to consider the words of George Whitfield, the great British evangelist. Come, poor, lost, undone sinner. Come just as you are to Christ. You might say, I, I can't come because of this, that, or the other. No, you can come. No matter where you are, what you've done, you can be saved. You can come to Jesus today. So if you don't know the Lord, could you put your hand up? If you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, if you would like to have the assurance that heaven is your home and Jesus is your Lord, just put your hand up high and I'm going to pray for you today. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I see that one hand. Is there anybody else here today? You want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Today, you would like to be saved. Don't resist the Holy Spirit of God. If you know you're not right with God and if you've never received the Lord, just put your hand up high and I'm going to pray for you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Because the gift of God is eternal life. You can come just as you are. Amen. I see that hand. God bless you.